we move on to the discussion phase. Uh, I marked down a few questions that didn't get answered during the session. Everybody's pretty tired by now, I think, but it would be nice to have a little chat if people want to turn on their screens. Uh, that would be good if they're still there. And so I had a question from Nadine to Lucas. If you are still there, Lucas, some people might have had to go because it's been a long afternoon. Lucas is not there. I can't see him. So we shall leave that one. Uh, now, Nick, are you still there? No, Nick's gone as well. Okay. I know you, I can see you there, Nick, but maybe you are otherwise occupied. But I'm, I'm here. Yeah. So there was a question from somebody. I didn't write it down, but are you aware of how many native bees have been screened for your virus? Was that the S? See yeah, uh, yes, uh, yes, separate virus. Yeah, yes, B, B, yeah. Uh, yes. particularly outside of AP Day. Yes, um, I did actually reply to oh, you Liv, did. uh personally, okay. but yeah, there, um, there's a paper by Laura Brettel, which, um, uh, I think that's one of the most comprehensive, um, research on screening native bees and also um, one of my supervisors, Elizabeth Fung, her, uh, her PhD thesis um, did uh, some of her work was a screening native bees for okay. um, for sacred virus and, and some other uh, common honeybee viruses. Yeah. Yeah, I know uh, Emily at, at our university, Emily Remnant, is looking at viruses in, in honeybees, but maybe she started to look outside of uh, honeybees. I don't know, but <laughs> she might be doing that. Yeah. So I, I think there are some uh, some halictines that um, that were they got some positive screening results for sacred virus. Uh, so that's yeah, a, a se completely separate family from uh, from the apidae. So there's a, some, some potential, I think, for, yeah, some pretty, uh, some, some further related uh, bees to be, um, to be susceptible to honeybee viruses. Yeah, now there's a question for you, Simon T. Any specific formicidae species to consider? Maybe, maybe you answered that. But maybe. Oops, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, no, so we grouped. Um, so for things like halictines or lasioglossum for say, we we couldn't determine species from the video, so we lumped everything into a single taxonomic unit. And the same thing for ants. Um, so we would occasionally on some farms get a lot of ants on a couple of trees. So um, and they're not really contributing to pollination. I think there's only a handful of ant species that are actually significant pollinators of plants and certainly not for apple. And so for, for lots of crops, some ants actually um, are, are a pest. And again, for I think things like persimmon and other, other crops. Um, but no, we just, we didn't distinguish between specific ant taxa is the answer. Okay, well, I have one question for James, but I think, yeah, he may have, might have answered it too, but he, someone asked you, do you think that if we were to add some pollen bearing plants in the vicinity of the pines, the honeybees could utilize the honeydew more and perhaps outcompete the wasps? James, you're still there, yep. Oh yeah, you're off mute, but we still can't hear you for some reason. You're Sorry, I had, I've yeah. muted my actual microphone on the headset. Um, uh, we are talking about feral honeybees here as well. So um, you probably wouldn't want to encourage them uh, too much to utilize the resource, but uh, it, adding extra pollen into the area would undoubtedly help uh, the honeybees that are using the honeydew. But at the same time, uh, honeybees don't, 
display the same level of aggressiveness and defensive resources that uh, Vespula species do, like Vespula Germanica is particularly well known for it. Um, so I just, yeah, I don't think the honeybees would ever really have a chance of outcompeting um, European wasps once they really got going. Do, do they fight with each other ever? The, the bees and the wasps? Bees and or... the wasps. Um, so the the best example is probably in New Zealand where they the bees are excluded, not necessarily through um, competition per se, but more through when, when the wasp numbers become high enough, uh, they found that the wasps uh, in search of prey become desperate enough that they will actually just start taking out hives um, to wow. continue to supply because they're they, they just start pumping out uh, queen brood towards the end of the season and you know three to four thousand three to four thousand queens need, uh, need a lot of food so oh, okay. they just take oh. any and all protein they can find okay now Lucas you're back that's good because Nadine had a question but I think it was yeah. answered Sorry. you asked mm -hmm. Lucas whether they could be sisters. I think you showed they were sisters. Yeah, yeah. So we had uh, nests where they were full sisters. Um, and then the only other association we had was these mother-daughter daughter nests. Yep. Okay. Yep. So that, that's that's only two types, sister-sister and mother-daughter. You yep. never get... Out of all the ones we genotyped, yeah. Yeah, that was all we got. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, so that it goes against what the so previously the all the genetic work done on adult nestmates was um, from Alzheimer data, um, yeah, and that showed that a lot of the nestmates were unrelated actually. Right. So when, yeah, <laughs> when they're unrelated, they typically share the uh, the reproduction. Uh, yeah, so the previous study didn't actually, it only sequenced um, with Alzheimer's nestmates, not uh, not any brood. Um, but it was assumed based on, you know, no differentiation in ovary size that, yeah, reproduction was shared. Good. Hey, there's Theo. Long time no see. Hello, how are you going? We should have... I, had a, I had a question for James, just a sort of a more philosophical natural history question. The, it was already called the European honeybee. It actually evolved in Africa and got taken to Europe by the Romans. And um, I'm not sure of the center of origin of uh, the German wasp. Is it European? And if so, are we just kind of recreating the original natural habitat of German wasps foraging in pine trees, and uh, which are sort of native to temperate areas of the world? And uh, so it's kind of what you would expect. It's a, an artificial assemblage, sure but it's sort of kind of more reminiscent of their evolutionary origin habitat. It's a very interesting uh, concept. So uh, to the best of my knowledge, yes, the European wasp is, does originate from Europe, um, not specifically Germany, but from the mainland. Uh, the main competitor in some other invaded areas with a second uh, Vespula species is vulgaris, Vespula vulgaris, which is the also known as the the English wasp. So there's a on and off mainland uh, Europe for those. In terms of the whether or not it's a natural sort of system, oh, not completely natural. Just not sure. Oh, uh, <laughs> not yeah. Uh, if we're sort of recreating the natural uh, way of things that you'd be seeing over there that you have uh, the issue of like, there's absolutely no population control for the European wasps in terms of the natural enemies that they would face uh, in Europe. So there's a number of brood parasites um, that really do in they inhibit the um, population over there quite significantly. So over here, what they've seen is that there's absolutely nothing that impedes uh, European, everything just gets out of their way or gets eaten by them. So we're seeing uh, that we see the population just expands as, as anywhere there's enough water, enough food and enough uh, carbohydrate, the wasps will move in and start to cause all sorts of ecological damage. So while it may be 
sort of a warped image of what might be natural, what might naturally occur in uh, the, throughout the Mediterranean, the, the pine forest there. Uh, it's it's different enough because um, of those uh, un, un, the uh, the lifting of those restraints uh, caused enough uh, change to that that oh, it's kind of it's, it's hard in that yes in one way and the damages that they're doing uh, I, I find it hard to philosophically uh, like wrap my head around why how it might be similar um, yeah. No, I was just sort of saying I'm not surprised honeybees don't do very well in those pine forests. But, um, and I guess I'm not that surprised that the wasps do reasonably well, that's all. And I'm not suggesting for a minute that you don't start trying to control them. Just that yeah, it's yeah. kind of a, from, it might not be such an, uh, a surprising result. Yeah, so it was only surprising to, in the respect that the in Europe and throughout the Mediterranean, the honeybees are like really the only thing capitalizing on the honeydew made by the giant pine scale there. But that is very much artificial because the uh, the the industry is moving all of these uh, hives into it, so it's an artificial domination of a resource. Yeah. yeah. And um, thanks, James. I have a second question. If I'm allowed to have a second question, mate. Absolutely. So this is to Elizabeth. I thought it was great trying to figure out how many colonies there are across the landscape. I'm very curious about that, uh, not just for honeybees, but for a bunch of social insects. I just want to just mention about that maximum distance of drones. Now, I don't know anything about how, how far honeybees fly, but I know a bit about how far termites fly. And the maximum distance is recorded at 1.2 kilometres, but the median distance is about 600 metres. So less than half what the maximum is. Very few people have tried to actually measure the distribution of those flight distances. They've just focused on the maxima. And so um, I just thought it might be interesting to focus on the sort of the median rather than the, those maximum distances. And if you've got access to that data set, maybe you could relate that to your results for your 900 of meters. Yeah, I think, thank you, Theo. I think that's a really great um, point to make because using the maximum distance in reality just isn't going to hold up. And my the limitation. And um, even though in my talk I was saying maybe we could reduce everything down to one kilometer, you're still getting drones from further than that. And in reality, you don't really know how or where they're coming from. So I think the next step would be to do the whole 44 kilometers squared and see if some patterns come up as well as doing it in different landscapes. Yeah. Have you, have you done similar methods in termites? No, okay, cool. <laughs> All right guys, we'd better uh, go over to the AGM now, just in case some people. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna open it up now. Yeah, thanks, Simon. So, thanks to all the speakers. It was a really good session. I, I enjoyed it a lot. And thanks for all your efforts with those beautiful talks. And see you in the AGM, those of you who are coming, in about uh, 20 seconds. Right. Are there.